Yeah, I was going to talk about um, the effect of climate tipping points on, uh, actually on the more conventional cost-benefit analysis of climate change, which is not to endorse that approach. Uh, I would have to say that, um, uh, as, if, as will become apparent, I, I don't think it's the right approach to the, to the macro climate change problem. But nevertheless, uh, my philosophy here was to engage with um, economist friends and look at how the work that we've been doing in climate science on climate tipping points affected um, the results of a very widely used uh, cost-benefit tool, which is um, Bill Nordhaus's DICE model, Nobel Prize laureate last year. So I'm going to start by talking a bit about the climate tipping points, because we need some information upon which to calibrate what we're going to put in the model. Um, you can read a bit more about what I think the latest science is telling us on the tipping points in a little piece in Nature last week. Um, I, like to look, I like to start with the long-term climate record, or the last 650,000 years, um, in case you're not familiar with it, the multiple ice age cycles as recorded in Antarctica and incredibly well correlated oscillations in CO2. I put this up here just to remind us that the Earth system is actually, I would argue, the climate is unusually unstable, abs even absent human activities, because it's undergoing these phenomenal um, sawtooth ice age oscillations under relatively weak orbital forcing. And these shifts are like four degrees in global temperature, 120 metres in the sea level. Um, and we're pushing the CO2 to roughly there, and in my lifetime we go off the top of the off the top of the slide. So we shouldn't be surprised if that won't carry some consequences. And even when we look within ice ages, we see the climate is, uh, is unusually unstable. We see multiple abrupt warming events. They're called downscarred Oshka events in our language. Um, they correspond sometimes to around 8 degrees centigrade of warming, as recorded in Greenland, within less than a decade. So if you don't know this already, it's, it's kind of important to know that the climate can behave in quite a volatile manner. We comfort ourselves that the last 10,000 years of the Holocene um, looks less jumpy, um, but it still has some structure within it. It has, if you lived in the tropics and it, uh, through the Holocene, you'd have experienced some tipping points in the hydrological cycle in many locations involving abrupt switches on and off of monsoon systems with implications for past civilizations. And that was before we started hitting the climate system hard. Now, conventional cost-benefit analysis, as I'm going to put it in a very cartoon form here, that we've got global temperature change on the x-axis and sort of price cost on the y-axis. Um, as we heard a bit from Hector earlier, in this framework, um, it deals with, an, uh, with smooth functions that it assumes are deterministic and are, and are well-known. So there's something called the damage function, or the cost of climate damages, and Etienne was... The first talk today was discussing a little bit about this. Um, your typical model like DICE doesn't think that's linear, it thinks it's quadratic. Um, but as we've heard already, um, the empirical foundation for such functions is, uh, is thin at best. Um, there's also an assumption that it's going to cost more the lower you want to hold the global temperature. Sorry, this is a bit funny to read in this, in this light. But that's the cost of mitigation. The lower you want to hold the temperature, the more expensive it's going to be, would be a sort of basic assumption. And as we heard from Hector, in a, in a conventional inverse uh, approach to cost-benefit analysis, assuming perfect knowledge and rationality, you just find the optimum, the minimum of the sort of sum of the two cost curves. But I'm interested in, well, if we acknowledge at least... if well, I would say for both the economy and the climate, but for, for the talk now, if we acknowledge that in the climate um, we don't perfectly know how it's going to behave and there could be some uncertain tipping points, perhaps at which the damages step up irreversibly, but we don't know exactly where they are, how does that affect the outcome of the analysis? That's the question I want to address. N neither can I, Michael, but it's usually fine, so let's just move on, because there's not, there's not going to be any more blue. It was the cost of... Mitigation, it was the cost of holding the temperature down. So, um, let's just have a look at a cart. Sorry, let's just. Ah! Don't do that. <laughs> Let, so, just to key us in, here's a little um, video or cartoon of a system passing a tipping point. 
where we're forcing it gradually, it's subject to stochastic fluctuations, but at some point the state that it started in is going to lose stability and the system has to transition into the other state at that point, which in other language is where um, self-amplifying positive feedbacks within the system dynamics take over from the buffering negative feedbacks that were creating the valley that's being lost. Um, we, have re we have good reason to think that lots of parts of the climate system could behave like this, and you saw some um, evidence to back that up from the paleo record a minute ago. Um, in fact, in the wider literature, it, we can re-cartoon tipping points on sort of static axes of, in terms of alternative stable states, the solid lines separated by an unstable steady state. The, these are the two valleys and this is the hill in between, if you like. And in that video, we started somewhere here and we went to that point there and then we tipped into the other valley. This cartoon notion of a tipping point, well, that's present in the literature for bits of the climate system and the overturning circulation of the Atlantic Ocean is a, an iconic example of a system with alternative stable states and tipping points that's implicated in those past climate shifts I showed you. But in ecology, there's a wide recognition of this kind of dynamics. For example, in the tipping of shallow or deeper lakes between clear water and eutrophic states. And in the analysis of past societal collapses, um, there's also some suggestion that tipping dynamics are present there. So in simple terms, this is thought to be uh, generic behavior across a range of complex systems. And there might, of course, be couplings between tipping events in the climate and in, other, and in ecosystems. And we have some work where we're looking into this, we've got some work in press, where we just looked at what's the implications of a collapse of the Atlantic overturning circulation if it were to happen on, on agriculture next door in Grand Britannia. Um, and what we see here is a, a pretty good econometric model of arable, arable agriculture in brown or grassland pasture agriculture in green in the UK. And under normal uh, climate change without irrigation, we predict some changes. We predict some drying in the southeast would make even wheat farming difficult there. But generally, arable would spread west and north under sort of smooth climate change. But if there were a collapse of the Atlantic overturning circulation, not only does it cool the UK, uh, the crucial effect here is it would dry the UK substantially and uh, the econometric model suggests would make arable agriculture unviable, basically. So we see a kind of abrupt shift, let's call it that, in um, land use in the UK with attendant economic impacts. Uh, but I'm going to keep my focus on the bigger scale and on um, my, some of my candidate tipping elements. So these are the bits of the climate system that um, I'm, I've argued would be, show evidence either from the past or from future model projections or from our basic understanding of the physics, show evidence for possible tipping behavior. Um, that was the map as it looked uh, about 10 years ago. As you'll see in a minute, we're revising our understanding of these things all the time. But if we're going to calibrate a model of costs and, and in particular of damages, um, we need some information on the likelihood of the different tipping events. And the, the currently um, most useful source we've got is, st is still 10 years old, but it's from an expert elicitation with about 50 different experts assigning imprecise probability ranges for the likelihood of tipping these five different bits of the climate system under low, medium or high warming. And out of this analysis, we're able to derive something I'll use later, which is a, a hazard rate, a sort of uh, temperature-weighted likelihood of tipping for these different elements. Um, what we took away from this even 10 years ago is that these are not um, high-impact, very low-probability events, which is what most economists assume. If you believe the scientists here, these are high-impact and quite significant probability events. Um, and that's a crucial difference, as we'll see. Since 2009, other bits of work have been done by others. One of my favourites is this analysis of the fifth assessment report IPCC models, where um, Sebastian Battiani, Sieber and Dreifout and others uh, ran an algorithm to look in the model scenarios of the future, can we find abrupt shifts uh, at sort of regional scales in the models? And they found quite a lot of abrupt shifts, 
in the model scenarios and, and surprisingly a lot of those abrupt shifts were clustered at one and a half to two degrees of warming above uh, pre-industrial. You might be wondering why there aren't a load of abrupt shifts here and that's because there aren't so many model scenarios that go up to high warming. So we should reweight the uh, histogram and then we'd see a big rise over here as well. But this hump would still exist and that's uh, perhaps a source of concern if you have any faith in the models. Um, and if I was to summarise information that as it's been gleaned over time, um, I, ver I put a version of this plot in last week's paper, Basically, when the IPCC first recognised what it called large-scale discontinuities in the climate system as a possibility, it put them at four to five degrees of warming above pre-industrial. And over time, with successive IPCC reports and the recent special reports in 2018-2019, and 20, um, the likelihood of tipping points has been getting closer to the present temperature, essentially. So that now, with the special reports on 1.5 degrees C and on the ocean and cryosphere, uh, you read the summary for policymakers, you'll see statements suggesting we can't rule out that tipping's already underway for parts of Antarctica at the current warming of 1.1 degrees centigrade. So this next map just summarises some of that information from the last decade of research. I just mentioned this, there's a part of the West Antarctic ice sheet which could be an irreversible retreat at present, it's certainly behaving like it is, and there's another piece of East Antarctica that's like that as well, uh, this drains about three or four metres sea level rise equivalent. This, we, from models, we would expect that losing the bit of the ice sheet that seems to be going already would tip the rest and would ultimately give another three or four metres of sea level rise. Lots of other things also uh, appear to be changing at an accelerating rate. Um, and we begin to see some empirical evidence that there are beginning to emerge some causal couplings as well between bits of the climate system that are changing. And we have some physics to um, reasoning behind why we would expect some causal couplings if it isn't obvious to you that in a climate system where the ocean and the atmosphere are transporting massive amounts of heat around, for example, of course there are causal interactions. So we see, for example, the Arctic's warming two or three times the global average rate and that loss of Arctic sea ice and the associated darkening of the Arctic uh, is a key factor in that warming. The abrupt loss of sea ice is really contributing to that accelerated warming. The warming over the Arctic Ocean spreads, you know, extends beyond the ocean onto Arctic land surfaces, so it plays a role in the accelerated warming and thawing of the permafrost that we see underway in parts of the Arctic. It plays a role in the accelerating melt of the Greenland ice sheet that we're observing. Some of those meltwaters coming off Greenland, pouring into either side of the North Atlantic, either side of Greenland, they're playing some role towards the freshening of those waters, which is implicated in the about 15% slowing down of the Atlantic overturning circulation that's been um, detected over the last half century. And we know from the paleo record that the slow, if you slow the overturning circulation down, you basically are transporting less heat from the southern to the northern hemisphere. So you drag the whole band of rainfall around the tropics that we call the intertropical convergence zone southwards. That tends to disrupt the monsoons in West Africa, which Andreas has just given us a talk about, and also around the planet in India as well as over in South America. And by leaving more heat behind in the Southern Ocean, well, that could ultimately contribute to the, the ice shelf uh, melt and ice sheet threat down there. Now, in the expert elicitation 10 years ago, we'd actually asked the experts about potential causal interactions between a subset of these tipping events. And this is a little visual summary of what the expert said 10 years ago. And a plus sign means if you tip one thing, it increases the likelihood of tipping the other, or if it's a minus, it decreases the likelihood. So I mentioned this causal interaction, the Greenland ice sheet melt increases the likelihood of collapsing the overturning. If you were to collapse the overturning first, you'd get less heat up here, it would slow the melting of Greenland, it'd be like a negative feedback. But there's slightly more pluses than minuses on the map, which is slightly concerning on face value because those aren't those are the kind of interactions we don't want they're the ones that could cascade where tipping one thing increases the likelihood of tipping another
Of course, it would require special conditions and a, partic and a certain strength of coupling for it to truly cascade or be like dominoes. Nevertheless, um, this is sort of consistent with my overall message that I don't think we live in a time where the climate system is particularly stable. I think we live in a time when it's uh, even absent our activities unusually unstable. I think it's you know, a bold proposition to uh, suggest that there could be a, a global uh, tipping point towards a different climate state, but we can't rule that out either. And we're still scratching our heads in paleoclimate research, trying to make our models reproduce known past hot states of the Earth, so-called hothouse states. The latest research is showing the, best, the models that have done the best at, at creating known past hot states include these kind of tipping points in clouds and cloud feedbacks. Um, but that's a worry if they're real, um, because if we could tip those in the future, um, we really could lose control of the climate situation. And the latest models returning for the sixth assessment report of IPCC, I'm afraid several of them now show a much higher climate sensitivity, which is the warming in response to a doubling of CO2. They now jumped up from three degrees to more than five degrees climate sensitivity, and that's because of a, an observation-based recalibration of cloud feedbacks in those models, which has basically um, taken out an important negative feedback from clouds that was damping climate change and is leaving the models prone to sort of jumping into this hotter state. Well, that should tell you enough about um, tipping points to hopefully convince you that there's a, there's a legitimate risk to think about there. Um, so let's go back to cost-benefit analysis and simple integrated assessment model tools. Um, what, what I got up to with um, Tom Longchak, Yong Yang Kai and Ken Judd was just trying to add the possibility of these climate tipping points into Nordhaus's famous DICE model. So this is the bit we've bolted on, is some tipping points which crucially we're going to treat um, in a stochastic dynamic way, not in the purely deterministic way that the rest of the model operates in. Um, so we've heard a bit about these models beforehand. They imagine that there's this omniscient social planner who's this perfect rational agent, who has this perfect view of this perfectly deterministic world, including the consequences of their actions and how they would unfold into the future. Um, none of us including, I'm sure, the originator of the model, think that reality is really like this, but that doesn't mean the model has no utility. It's still an interesting tool to play with. This social planner, in the optimising way these models work, the social planner is, is setting, trying to set an optimal consumption and greenhouse gas mitigation level, and the model is sort of designed to return a, some optimal policy suggestion. We're adding this stochastic component, which is to say... Um, there's a likelihood, it's like a dice rolling event, I might roll a tipping point and as the temperature goes up my dice are going to get loaded to make it more likely to roll a tipping uh, point but it's still got a stochastic component to it and this means we're changing the way we compute the model, we have to treat it in an ensemble way, we have to do 10,000 or whatever runs of the model on a supercomputer uh, to try and do some much harder inverse solving um, to get back to uh, these quasi-optimal trajectories under uncertainty. One of the first things we found when we put these stochastically uncertain tipping points in the model um, is something summarised here, which might look a bit confusing. But basically, uh, the message here is, in these models, the deterministic model um, has a discount rate. Everybody know what a discount rate is? Or, uh, OK, good. And that dictates... Um, that, that the, actually the, the, op, the element of the optimal policy, which is to set a price on carbon emissions, a social cost of carbon, or a carbon tax, if you like, um, that tends to grow over time in a way that's somewhat controlled by the fact that we have a discounting in the model. And that, that carbon tax uh, tends to grow at about 2% year on year in the standard model. When we add tipping points in, we're obviously adding the possibility of extra damages um, and sure enough, we expect the carbon tax to increase accordingly to try and avoid or limit those damages. But what was really interesting is that the um, effects on the carbon tax growth rate here of adding, the tip, of adding one tipping point um, didn't show the same discounting effect, which surprised us initially. 
So uh, you could think of this as the prospect of perhaps a, a tipping point far in the future wasn't being discounted away because of its distance in the future quite as much as all the other deterministic damages. And the red curves are just the sort of thing that happens if instead of doing stochastic tipping points, you just take the damage function and make it slope up faster. Well, you get the same issue that it would get uh, discounted away if it's a deterministic function quite strongly. So anyway, maybe that didn't make sense, but why would, um, why would stochastically uncertain tipping point damages, which carry an irreversible quality to them, why would they not be discounted away um, as much as sort of deterministic damages? Uh, it, apparently this goes back to some, uh, what I'm told is fairly standard uh, economics, which is that the social planner or your economic actor doesn't like uncertainty on future well-being or future consumption, just as they don't like negative hits on future consumption. So now there's a double effect. The, the social planner wants to limit bad, known bad future outcomes, but they also want to limit uncertainty around uh, future utility or whatever you want to call it in economic language. So uh, they want to re reduce the variance on future consumption as well as try to limit any reductions in the magnitude of future consumption. And basically that gives back a result that, the, that you get a more precautionary response, which you can think of like uh, insurance policies where people are willing to pay a really high premium, in fact, uh, against, uh, well, to insure against uh, uncertain but possible future losses. So it turns out that you, in the way these models work, the uh, future tipping point damages get, and impacts get discounted less. And we should be willing to pay a higher premium now to try and avoid irreversible future tipping point damages. So further, further stuff on what, how we stick the tipping points in the model, we had to specify this thing, the hazard rate, the dice rolling probability that goes up with the temperature. Um, we have to say something scientific about how long it takes a system to tip once you've triggered it. Yeah, I got you. We're nearly there. Uh, and this is based on uh, fairly solid science. So, like, it takes decades to collapse the Atlantic overturning circulation. It takes centuries to collapse ice sheets. We don't really know, but it might take decades to collapse the Amazon rainforest and so on. As we heard earlier, it's guesswork as to what the damages are of any of these events. But Nordhaus himself argues that a collapse of the overturning would be a 25% hit on GDP, like the Great Depression of the 1920s and 30s. So I'm going to argue that I'm being uh, conservative and assigning it a 15% uh, hit on GDP. Everything is around the 10% level here, which for a reference point is like the 2008-9 recession. That was a 10% hit on GDP. So I don't think I'm inflating the damages. In this case, of, for Greenland, it's a 7 metre sea level rise. I, I'm fairly confident that at a minimum that would be a 10% hit on GDP, not least because it would flood uh, Shanghai, London, New York and a bunch of other mega cities. So this is the, the big, this is the main result. Um, concentrate on the green line, which is the original model, and the black line with the grey shaded area around it, which is the result you get with the tipping points included in the model. So if we talk about the ori original dice first, um, it doesn't say do nothing at present. It says do some mitigation of greenhouse gas emissions and ramp that up steadily over the century. That's this emissions control. That has a corresponding social cost of carbon or carbon price associated with it, which starts at something like $16 per tonne of CO2 in this version of the model, but goes up to 100 at the end of the century. Um, you're doing some mitigation, so atmospheric CO2 is still rising, but it starts to curve over as the mitigation kicks in, and temperatures rises to about 3 degrees at the end of the century, and it's going to stabilise eventually, maybe, sometime next century. That's what Bill Nordhaus has famously said is optimal, three degrees of warming. Um, I disagree. Uh, and when we put the tipping points in, we got a radically different result. I should say we did some other things uh, to change the risk preferences in the model to be appropriate for stochastic uncertainty. Uh, so we could talk about that in the questions if you like. But the, you get back a very different result. You get an immediate more than 50% shutdown in greenhouse gas emissions a sh complete shutdown by mid-century, uh, 
Um, so that translates into a, setting a fairly high social cost of carbon, more than eightfold above what it was in the original model at the beginning and ramping up over time with this uncertainty range around it. And because we're now really shutting down fossil fuel burning by mid-century, the atmospheric CO2 level peaks and actually then might even decline in this model. And we managed to hold the line of warming at around or less than one and a half degrees, given the assumptions about climate sensitivity in this model. It's worth knowing that it's too easy to mitigate greenhouse gas emissions in, in DICE compared to what many economists think. But the key result here is we've come out with a fundamentally qualitatively different answer from the model. And in my view, it's broken one of the assumptions of the cost-benefit analysis, which is that all this environment climate stuff is just a marginal externality. This is saying it's not a marginal externality because it's saying the optimal thing to do is completely change what we're doing, transform the energy system in, in the next uh, 30 years or whatever. So uh, the whole underlying assumption of the framework, I think, is challenged by the results. But the results are quite consistent in what they say with what we know from other models and other reports, which is if we want to get any, any chance of limiting warming near one and a half degrees, we have to stop all greenhouse gas emissions by 2050 and then go net greenhouse gas removal in the latter part of the century. Um, if you want to look at more into the model, it's good fun. Uh, in a 10,000 sample pass of the model, you can find examples where you do trigger tipping points despite your best efforts. And in the case you trigger Greenland to go first, because it increases the likelihood of collapsing the Atlantic overturning, it bumps the, climate, uh, the carbon price up immediately. But if you pass the big tip damaging tipping point of the Atlantic overturning circulation collapse, you reduce the incentive to mitigate because you've already passed this irreversible threshold, and so on. Anyway, let's wrap it up. Uh, I'm trying to say, in simple terms, tipping points are not high-impact, low-probability events. They're going to be high-impact, high-probability events if we carried on business as usual. That fundamentally changes the economic cost-benefit analysis. It basically recognises then that this is an existential risk and therefore we change radically what we're doing. We ch do everything in our power to shut down fossil fuel burning and find a long-term sustainable energy source, etc., etc., which in the model world corresponds to a particular carbon price, at least $100 a tonne of CO2, which I would say ought to be, as Hector said earlier, within a portfolio of other interventions. And I think now what I'm trying to do is... Uh, talk about the positive tipping points or the sensitive intervention points, as Matt put it, that we need to find in our, in our social economic systems uh, to get us through this transformative change uh, in the timescale required. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tim, and many thanks for stepping in. Uh, any questions for Tim? I can see. Hi, Tim. Thanks for your talk. Um, the economic measure uh, that you and other speakers today have used is, is GDP growth. And yeah. um, so far, all of our uh, attempts to improve or well, to reduce emissions have been foiled by ongoing economic growth. Um, I've tried to look a little bit into the potential to decouple emissions from GDP, and it seems to be quite limited. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the question then comes, uh, is our economic system fundamentally compatible with a decarbonised world? Can you comment a little bit on your thoughts on that, please? I'm glad you asked that question. Uh, I, share your, um, I share all the motivation behind your question, I think. Um, in the UK, at least when you listen to the, uh, your friends in Bayes or whatever, then they show you plots of how there is some degree of decoupling between GDP and greenhouse gas emissions in the specific case of the UK, even when we count in all the extra rubbish we're buying made elsewhere in the world. But still, can we really, uh, this is the killer question, can we really uh, decouple D GDP growth from harming the climate, the environment, whatever you want to describe it as? I find it as a, from when I look in my, the physicist bit of my head, I, I find it hard to see how it would be possible to achieve a full decoupling. Uh, 
Um, not least because even in an information-based economy, information has an entrop is low or is is high order, low entropy situation that needs free energy input to maintain it. I have some degree of optimism that uh, uh, a largely solar-powered future uh, economy that also devoted some of the very cheap, I think it will be, solar energy into recycling all the materials we need to make new stuff out of old stuff. I have some thermodynamic reasons why I think that could be a much lower impact on the climate ec environment economy. Um, it couldn't be zero impact though, clearly. Uh, and I think it could still be one um, with high, let's call it well-being, that's for sure. Um, but I'd be with you in um, wanting to shift broader than GDP. And I think other speakers have raised that today. Uh, and I, certainly over the water in the UK, we've had some discussion about uh, a broader way of encapsulating social uh, collective well-being in, 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 in better indicators. So I'd like to see more of that. Um, the last thing to say is we did some other work where we put... And the unsubstitutability of the biosphere and our life support system into, into DICE as well. And we put in the, this, this thing that often gets missed in a cost-benefit analysis. It often assumes that the benefits from the environment, the climate or whatever are substitutable. And that's a crucial mistake to make if you believe they're not. And as soon as you say that they aren't, following work that um, Thomas Sterner did, for example, um, you put that into the, let's call it the welfare function or the utility function, you suddenly find they have an enormous influence on the model behaviour. Um, so if we just do some, what I view as common sense things and recognise that our life support system is not substitutable, we get back the same kind of answers here, which is, uh, hold on a minute, we've got to change what we're doing so that we don't scupper it. Uh, yeah. Any other questions? Hey. That's a quick question about uh, the, the way that the carbon price affects a carbon emissions in the DICE model. I mean, implicitly, we don't have the kind of investment that should be done in terms of capital stock in order to build the infrastructure. Pre pre precisely, yeah. So, so in that sense, we also don't have the financial side of that. And as a result, if we have, for example, an increase in carbon price that is uh, higher than uh, $100, uh, we might see some very significant financial stability effects and of also, of course, inequality effects. So there is a lot of debate about that. Uh, so I'm just wondering what do you think are the policies that should implement a very high carbon tax uh, implementation uh, in order for this to be successful? Because we know that if we just have a carbon tax that is too high, this, this is not going to work. It, it is going to create a lot of other instabilities in the system. Sure. Yeah, and I thought some of the talks before lunch were good on that, right? We saw scenarios from models where you may not need to set it as high and might still be able to affect the transition because you, uh, you treated the nonlinear dynamics. I just flicked onto this slide. It's an old study and it's not Hector's group, I don't think, or uh, Cambridge Econometrics, but it's yet another model where you can find that the Green New Deal scenario turns out to have higher employment, higher GDP and lots of other stuff. It does require the investment sector to do a major shift in an increase in investment in the new infrastructure that has to be built. So I'm, I don't pretend to be an economist. Uh, I'm not advocating the single use of carbon tax as a blunt instrument, but as a sort of uh, fan of common sense and a, and a climate scientist, I, I, I think uh, I'm all for a diverse range of policy interventions, and Hector hinted at that earlier, but I still think a blunt instrument of putting a sensible price on the damages the social cost of carbon, in other words, the damages that derive from emitting one tonne of CO2 is absolutely essential. The fundamental problem we have now is we are not pricing the damages from that pollutant at anything like the proper level. And it's then no surprise that we get, uh, we, we're busy propelling ourselves into a climate catastrophe, in my view. Um, so we could quibble about, I don't know, is it a carbon tax, is it something else? 
But at some fundamental level, I think businesses understand blunt instruments. They know how to pass on prices to their customers. I'm not qualified to get into the intricacies of economics, but just speaking for the climate or, or other life or whatever, uh, we absolutely need uh, all of our economics to recognise the cost of the damages that come from this pollutant and other greenhouse gases. And, we've got to f and they've got to be set at a sensible level. So... I'm not saying exactly, maybe I'm wrong on what that sensible level is, but I would be very uncomfortable with coming away from today being convinced that, oh, it could just be a few tens of dollars of C uh, per tonne of CO2. That, for me, would be completely against the science of this. The damages are much higher than that, in my view. Okay, thank you. Any other questions, Michael? If there are... Um no other questions. We would like to thank Tim for his presentation. Many thank you.